man. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. spirit with life from above into God's family divine justified holy through Calvary's love oh what a standing is mine and the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took the offer of grace and did proper all oh, save me all oh, praises dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessing supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down. day, amen, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and he washed your sins away. Well, thank you for joining us for our service this morning. Pastor Pooley will come and he'll lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this Lord's Day. We're thankful for this beautiful day that you've given to us and we're thankful for each one that's here this morning. We pray that you would just bless this time. We pray that you'd meet with us here in a special way. Pray that the Holy Spirit would work in hearts this morning. And Father, that we would be stirred up, that we'd be built up, that we'd be challenged, convicted if need be. Father, that we would have a desire to make decisions, that we'd have a de desire to be changed. Mm -hmm. Father, that we might be more conformed to the image of your Son. We pray, Father, that you would give us a passion for souls, that we would have a a desire to go out and tell others about Jesus Christ and Father that you would just uh, work in us pray that you would work in the hearts of those that may be here this morning or tuning in online that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior we pray that uh, you would work there in their hearts and that the Holy Spirit would convict them and, and uh, open their eyes that they might see what they really are, that they're a lost sinner in need of a Savior, and that Jesus came to save. And so, Father, we pray that they'd come to that saving knowledge today. Pray for those that are not able to be with us here today. We pray that uh, you'd meet with them in a special way as well, that you would draw them close to you, and that you would strengthen and encourage them. And if it be your will that they might be able to uh, meet with us here once again, we pray for your servant as he brings your message today. We pray that you give him the words to say, the wisdom that he needs. Help him to do better than he knows. And Father, that you would just give him the liberty of speech. That uh, 
uh, you would just uh, work through him and, and use him today. And Father, we just pray that you would put away all distractions, that we might uh, be focused on your message today. And we just pray now that as we continue on here this morning, pray that all that takes place would bring honor and glory to you. We pray that we might see Jesus, that he be high and lifted up today. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. And so we will start reading in verse 38. Acts chapter 13. Starting in verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of, the ever, of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's continue singing. Let's turn to number 471. 471. As we sing, Love found a way. Love found a way to redeem my soul. Aren't you thankful for that love? Amen. Perfect love. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved, right? Gold twitch 
statement, I am redeemed, set free, forgiven, love found a way. Three wonderful, exciting things in one phrase, right? Amen. What exciting things we have to sing about, right? And exciting truths. And I trust that you can sing it truthfully, that you're redeemed, you've been set free, and that you are forgiven. If not, it's only through Jesus Christ, right? And praise the Lord, God loved us enough to send his only begotten son. Well, let's sing on that third verse, Love opened wide the gates of life. Love opened wide the gates of light to heaven's domain, where in eternal power and might Jesus shall reign. Love lifted me from depths of woe, that name Jesus which means Amen. Savior right praise the Lord let's have a look at our announcements and so what's coming up well uh, trust you'll join us this evening Lord willing for our evening service and of course as we noted in the bulletin we are observing the Lord's table this evening so trust that you'll join us for that a special special time in the life of the church and so uh, be sure to join us for that and of course coming up in the middle of the week we're looking forward to our midweek prayer and bible study that's wednesday at seven o'clock be sure to join us for that and uh i know it says birthdays and anniversaries in june and uh, we've been made aware that we are we have the july birthdays and anniversaries listed here and i think the reason behind that is to give you more time to buy gifts for these people okay and so uh but just remember it's july okay not not june okay and so i am sure that will be corrected for next week lord willing but uh it can happen right cut and paste and oh I know all about it. I believe that's all we have for announcements. And so uh, we're going to have Robin come now. She's going to come and minister to us in music.
Thank you for that, Robin. Be thou my vision. Wonderful old hymn. Let's turn to number 474 in our hymnals. 474. And we'll stand together as we sing. Only a sinner saved by grace. 474. First, second, and last. Not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Hopefully Pastor Pooley will forgive me for giving him such a song so high for morning service. And I never think of it until we get to that chorus and think, man, we got to push that to reach that high there on grace. But he did well. Let us take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13. In this passage, of course, the Apostle Paul, or uh, the Apostle Paul, Paul isn't even on the scene yet. It's uh, the, uh, uh, in this passage here, in the, in, the, in the, I should say, Luke is writing, and we come down to this particular passage, and of course, they're speaking, it is Paul's sermon, by the way, but they are speaking of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When he says in verse uh, 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, this man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Where I want you to focus your attention, though, on that we're going to look at this morning is towards the end of the passage based upon the message preached by Jesus Christ and by the work accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, He's able to come to the end of this passage and summarize here, as he says in verse 50, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. They've got a great message to bring here, amen? They've got the message of the gospel. They've got the message of Jesus Christ our Lord, the message 
of salvation. I mean, this is good news for the people. Don't we love to hear good news? I know we've gotten away from the days of letter writing, but there was a day in which you uh, got excited when you'd receive a letter in the mail. I think today we'd probably fall over if we received a letter in the mail. But uh, there was days when you would receive a letter in the mail from a family member that perhaps was living a distance away, and it was always exciting to receive good news from them, amen? And, uh, you know, this, this was a message of good news that they had to proclaim, and yet it's not received that way, is it? They stir up the people, they stir up those and cause persecution against Paul and Barnabas and those that are with them. But in verse 51, it says, But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. A while ago, not all that far ago, I know I preached a message on joy that we have as born-again believers, and we went through a number of things talking about the joy of the Lord. And this morning, what I wanted to do was take this opportunity to talk about how we can have that joy. We have to understand, of course, that when we speak of joy, when we look at the Scriptures and what the Scriptures specifically talk about joy here for us, is not feeling-based. And I know I've talked about this before. Sometimes when we think of people that are joyful, you know, they're people that are generally happy and uh, generally, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're upbeat personalities, and we say, oh, they're such joyful people. But joy from a, I saw Hannah back there poking Blake, because Blake's a joyful person. You ask Blake how he's doing, the world could be crashing around him, and he's wonderful. He's just one of those people, amen? <laughs> I see everything from the pulpit, Hannah. <laughs> But, you know, some people, they're, they're joyful people, but, and, but their joy is based upon how they're feeling at that particular time. You know, we, uh, have a health crisis come along or have a situation in hap that uh, would happen and they lose their joy simply because that joy was, you know, based on how they were feeling. But the joy of the Lord, the joy that we see in the scriptures, guess what? It's not feeling based. We're not joyful simply because we're feeling happy and we're feeling content and our bellies are filled and our heads are dry and, and life is grand. That's not the joy we're talking about here. In fact, it's quite the opposite. When you search the scriptures on joy, one of the things that comes up and is quite prevalent is that joy is spoken in the context a lot of times of persecution, of trial, of difficult times, and no different than we see right in this passage right here. Joy is spoken of in the sense that here they are, they're serving God. They're doing the work that God had called them to do. And, and you know, that is exciting. When you're in the will of the Lord, it is an exciting time for the believer. But it, guess what? It, it can be very challenging and difficult. The Apostle Paul was warned. You know, you think of, uh, you know, here we have Paul and Barnabas. Paul called into ministry, which should be an exciting time for any individual that's called to full-time ministry. It's like, man, I get to serve the Lord every day, preaching the gospel, ministering to folks, and that should be, you know, exciting. But Jesus tells Paul, you're called into ministry, he tells them through Ananias, and you are going to suffer. Boy, that's not, that's not exciting news, is it? That does not uh, bring up visions of how great and grand this, this work type of work is going to be. It's quite the opposite. And yet, here we have the Apostle Paul in the midst of being persecuted and chased out of this particular city here, and it says, and... Uh, they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples, including Paul and Barnabas, were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The joy we're talking about here is a joy that's 
sometimes hard to explain. It's a joy that, like I just described Blake, you know, he walks with the Lord, he's faithful, and guess what? Even in the midst of challenging times, he can say, you know what? Life is wonderful. That's the joy we're talking about here. Joy not based on feeling, but a joy based upon being filled with the Holy Ghost and walking with the Lord. Amen? That's the joy we're talking about. We're to be joyful people. People that are filled with the joy of the Lord. That joy is a joy of calmness, if you like. A joy of uh, uh, calmness and contentment that comes with a relationship with God. So the question is, and where I want to focus on this morning is, not so much of describing what that joy is, but how can we have that joy? Because that's a challenge, isn't it? We can search the scriptures and we can see how these individuals were filled with joy in the midst of persecution and challenge, but how do we make that happen in our lives today? Because guess what? We've got challenging times, don't we? You know, each and every day of our lives is and can be very challenging times. So the question is, how can our joy be full? Three things I want to share with you, starting from here this morning. And if for us, in order for us to be filled with joy, to be joyful, number one, we need to and we must, in order to have the joy of the Lord, we must trust in God's Son. That, is, that goes without saying. We can be joyful simply because we're happy people. And we can be joyful because we're doing wonderful things. But if we do not have the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we really cannot have the joy of the Lord. We cannot have the, the joy that uh, is, is a joy that is beyond explanation unless we have the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is foundational to it. Look at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And if you start in Romans chapter 14 and ver look down at verse 17, it says in verse 16, Let not then your joy be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. I sometimes wonder if when you think of Jesus in his own element there amongst his people, the Jewish people, the thing that they were anticipating, one of the reasons why they uh, sent him to the cross of Calvary, we know it was by God's design and plan that he might pay for the sins of the whole world, but one of the reasons used was the fact that he had not ushered in the kingdom. The Jews had this vision that when God would set up his kingdom, that it would be their kingdom, they would be in control of their own domain, and that they would be freed from the oppression that they were suffering from under Roman rule here. But, it would, but the, you know, God's kingdom is not a fleshly and earthly kingdom. He says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but, he says, righteousness and peace and what? Joy, the same joy we're talking about, and here's the key, in the Holy Ghost. That's God's kingdom. Now, we know God will set up his kingdom. It's coming. Not, it's not here yet. We're not building the kingdom. It's not going to happen in the church age. It's going to follow the tribulation period, the millennial kingdom, right? God is going to send up his, uh, set up his kingdom. That's coming. But what he's describing in here is that, you know, from a spiritual point of view, he says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In order for us to be filled with the, with the joy of the Lord, we must have the Holy Spirit indwelling our hearts. Because that's what's key to this joy we're talking about here. Romans chapter 15 
over in Romans chapter 15. If you look at verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore... Receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God through, uh, for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people, and again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Both Jew and Gentile here will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And then in verse 13, he says, now the God of hope fill you with all what? Joy and peace and believing. Again, there's the key, isn't it? Fill you with all joy and peace. That peace in Philippians that passeth all understanding. That joy, that joy of the Lord we're talking about. In believing, he says, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, two passages here that we're looking at, you see the connection between the joy of the Lord and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. This, this joy is not based upon our feeling. It's not based upon the weather. It's not based upon whether the sun comes up and shows itself or based on, you know, it's not absent because of uh, how many rainy days we'd have in a row. Could you imagine if our joy was simply based upon our, the environment around us? If you lived in a place like St. John's, Newfoundland, or uh, B.C., Vancouver, uh, two of the, I believe, as highest number, day, number of days of rain in the country. They're on the coast, so it's kind of natural that they would. I think you'd want to give up and move to Arizona sun something like 300 out of 365 days a year, or some crazy thing like that, right? But, you know, our joy is not based upon the environment around us. You know, it's not based upon the weather. It's not based upon our health, because if that's where our joy was based, it would be up and down like a roller coaster. No, our joy is to be based upon the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit working in our hearts. So we need to trust in God's Son. Salvation is foundational to the joy of the Lord. Without the, the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified, where would we be? Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. A familiar passage here in verse 22. As the Apostle Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. So if our joy was based upon the environment around us, then our joy would be based upon our flesh, all right? And our flesh is not very reliable because he says the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no joy described in any of those things, is there? But he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, 
the results of dwelling in the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and living for the Lord Jesus Christ and walking in obedience with God, the fruit of that is love and what? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. The second one in the list there is the fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know, our joy, the joy of the Lord is directly connected to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So you know what controls our joy, what affects our joy? Two things. One is having the Holy Spirit to begin with. So you must trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, because without Jesus Christ, you cannot have the joy of the Lord. And number two, based upon Ephesians, if you quickly look over to Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. In other words, when we talk about being filled with the Spirit here, it talks about being Spirit-controlled, yielding up our spirit to the Holy Spirit, yielding up our lives to the Holy Spirit, and allowing the Holy Spirit to have our life and to control it. That's what impacts our joy. And sometimes if we find we're, we're losing our joy, we have to say, okay, am I trying to uh, control, am, am I quenching the Holy Spirit? Am I trying, you know, am I trying to take control over the Holy Spirit instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of me. That's what impacts our joy. Is we need to trust God's Son, for starters. Number two, we need to trust in God's power. We need to trust in God's power. In other words, we need to ask yourself, what is our view of God? Oh, we believe in God, you know, as born-again believers, we ought to believe in God. That's foundational to salvation, isn't it? We must believe in God. We must believe in Jesus Christ, that he's his only begotten son. We must believe that Jesus is the divine son of God. He's God come in the flesh, right? So you can't get away with saying, well, I'm a believer, and I'm, I'm going to heaven, but I don't believe in God. No different than you can say, I'm a born-again believer, and I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, they go hand in hand, right? But we have to ask ourselves, what is our view of God? Do we just simply see God as sort of standing in the background, sort of letting life take place around us with no impact or no control over life? Or is God still doing a work in our lives? Do we see God as being fully aware of what we're doing and what we're thinking and how we're behaving? Or do we simply see God as that one we go to when we need him most? No, sometimes, even as believers, we can kind of get into that trap of going through our lives and only turning God to God at our most difficult times. And, and you know, even, even I, in a little way, sometimes find that you know, just, just in our prayer life, turning to God, instead of it being automatic that any challenge we face or any possible challenge, you know, something that could happen, do we pause and pray? Or do we wait until we're at that point of frustration when we finally say, oh man, I should take this to God? Certainly when we get to the point of frustration, we should, amen? We should be saying, okay, God, I need your help. But even better, even before we get to that point saying, Hey, I'm, I'm starting this decision, I'm starting this venture, whatever it might be, and I could encounter trouble, so maybe I start with God's help now, amen? That is having an idea of who God is and the fact that God is still in control. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Chapter 5. We need to trust in God's power. In other words, we need to have a proper view of God. Realize just how much God is aware of what we're going through, of what we're facing. That's why he tells us we have a high priest in the book of Hebrews who is tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. You know, Jesus understands our situation, right? 
He understands what we face on a daily basis. So you can be guaranteed if Jesus does, God knows, amen? God knows what we face and what we go through. Sometimes we have this idea, well, God just doesn't understand. No, God does. Better than you think, right? We need to trust in God's power. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. So believers, he's referring to, Peter's writing to, other born-again believers in a time of challenge, persecution, apostasy, all the things that they faced in the early church there. You'll get into it as you read down through this handful of verses here. And he says, who are kept by the power of God through what? Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, the, the apostle Peter is trying to impress upon these believers to be mindful of the fact that it's God's power that's keeping you day by day. Who are kept, we are kept by the power of God. Do we have a right view of God? Carry on in verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, which is really is when we think about it, in the midst of what they were facing, Peter says to them, you know, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. It's almost, you know, we kind of put it on the scale. Rejoice when trouble and peril is low, right? No rejoice when things are tough and difficult and challenging, right, and pressing us above measure. And Peter's saying, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense from a scale point of view because Peter's saying, hey, you rejoice even though you're in the midst of, you know, great persecution and so on, and that's because they could rejoice in the power of God to protect them and to deliver them and to guide them through whatever it was that they were facing. That the, and look at verse 7. He says, uh, greatly rejoice, though now for a season, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen... That's, that's, that's some of the trouble we have with understanding and believing in the power of God. If we would have been there with Moses as he faced the Red Sea, nowhere to turn, and we saw, and I know I just spoke of this recently, saw the seas depart it, we could believe in the power of God, couldn't we? And we could stand there in awe and say, wow, this is our God. You know, if we were there on the Jordan River, when Joshua had the priest put their foot in the river and the, the river backs up and, and, and it happens at flood time. In other words, it's just like spring, right? All the water's coming down out of the Galilean mountains and that whole region, the snow is melting. And the river backs up and they cross on dry land. We could look at that and say, wow, you know, this is our God doing that. But we don't see those things today, do we? But yet it should not diminish what we believe about the power of God and what God is able to do in our lives. But he says, whom having not seen, even though we haven't seen God face to face, we haven't seen Jesus Christ face to face. However, he says, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with what? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, we need to trust in the power of God. Well, if we haven't seen God necessarily at hand doing amazing things. Sometimes it's hard to, to see that. Sometimes it's hard to believe in the power of God. That's why, when you think back, we won't go back there and look, but when Moses was getting the nation of Israel 
ready to go into the promised land. He has led them through some amazing things. And you know what Moses does? Moses recounts what God had brought them through. He says, remember, go back to when you were in Egypt and they were oppressing you and and God brought you across the Red Sea and then protected you in the wilderness and provided food and, and did all these incredible things. Moses goes back and reminds the people, look what God has done. Look what God has provided for you. Joshua, at the end of his lifetime and the end of his service and and ministry to the people, they've now settled into the land. They've had the opportunity to live there in peace. His time's coming to an end. And you know what Joshua does? He walks them back through the same story. Now, there's a number of times you'll see that in Scripture. It's go back and look and remember what God has done. And then even when you come down um, to the book of Acts, you won't turn there. But as I think of uh, you know, the ministry of the, the apostles and the work, they did the same thing. Acts chapter 2, well, just very, very briefly turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Exciting days, the church is starting, Jesus has ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit will come down upon the the believers here, and some amazing things will be happening. But you notice what uh, what Peter does in this particular passage. And in verse 14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, God, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons. He will go down through this passage here and he will talk about the things that God did with the nation of Israel, with uh, his servant David. And so Peter will do the same thing. He'll go back and remind the people, this is what God is doing. You know, if we want to have the joy of the Lord, we need to trust in God's power. And in order for us to trust in God's power, guess what? We have to remind ourselves. Look what God has done. And you don't have to go too far, do you? You only have to remember back to your own salvation and think, man, where would I be without Jesus Christ? Where would I be today if I hadn't trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior? That's looking back at the power of God, isn't it? You look back to what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Paul says, without the resurrection, we'd be men most what? Most miserable. We'd be without hope. And we can so easily go back and look at what God has done in the lives of his people, both even recent past and distant past. Now, if we want to have the joy of the Lord, we need to trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Number two, we need to trust in God's power. We need to take the time, especially when we are in the midst of a trial or in the midst of anguish, or maybe we feel like we're faltering, is to stop and go back and say, you know what, I need to count my blessings. We sing that song, right? Count your blessings, see what God hath done, right? And you know what? It's important for us. We see the pattern in scriptures. They set up their Ebenezer in the wilderness wanderings. The reminder, look to God, right? And that's what it does. When we think back to what God has done, and we look at who God is, and we see his his power, we're reminded that, yeah, God is still on the throne. God is still in control. And as difficult as this may seem, I know God is still in my life. So we need to trust in God's power. And then number three, 
We need to trust in God's message. We need to trust in God's message. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, He says here in verse 6, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry, don't be consumed with worry of things you cannot change. He says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. It's, it's opening that door of communication with God, amen? Amen. In other words, looking and listening to God's message, listening to His Word. Carry on there. In verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is where the Word of God becomes important to us. This is why we encourage memorizing you know, parts of Scripture. Find those verses that have a, every verse of the scripture has meaning, amen, and is important to us. But there's some passages that really strike a chord in our heart. And that's, it's so important to memorize some of those verses so when we can't even get our hands on the word of God for a season, we still have those in our heart to encourage and to remind us. We need to trust God's message. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, and I think this is key, he says, whatsoever things are true, well, what things do we know to be true? Yeah, the Word of God, right? You know, anything we take from another person may or may not be true. In this day and age, it all depends on whose truth it is or what perspective you're looking at it from, right? Because my truth can be different than your truth, and it gets real confusing after that. But... So we need something that we know is true, right? Tangible things around us, you know, we know. We know that this wood up here on this pulpit is solid. I know that I can lean onto it. I'm probably not going to fall over, mostly. <laughs> you know, the things that are tangible, that's easy to see as true. But one thing we know for sure is that God's Word is always true, amen? So he says, finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest... Once again, what do we find honest in this world today, in our lives today? Well, one thing we know for sure that is honest is the Word of God once again, right? We can always trust the Word of God to be honest, even when we don't like it. Because, boy, there's sometimes you're reading a passage in the Word of God that points to something in our own life, and we kind of go, ooh. But yet we say, well, Lord, if that's true of me, then... I need to deal with it because it's honest, amen? So we know that word. He said, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Now, every one of those things, we can come down to the same conclusion, right? The things in this world are based on perspective on your background, what you believe, where you're from. But guess what? The Word of God doesn't change, does it? The Word of God is the same no matter what, and guess what? The Word of God is all these things, right? He says, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and you can almost see uh, the Apostle Paul saying, listen, people, there is virtue, Right? <laughs> If there be any praise, and again, you can see him repeating that, people, there is praise in everything about God. He says, and, and here's the challenge, and the key, I think, is what? Think on these things. In other words, get our minds off what's going on around us. Get our minds off this day and age of things that are changing and constantly you know, causing a challenge to us and all that, get our minds off that and get our minds on God. Now, that doesn't mean we isolate ourselves and, 
and go into a cocoon or cone of silence and uh, isolate ourselves from everything going on. No, be aware of what's going on in the world. But don't be consumed by it. Don't be so fixated on watching uh, you know, CNN and, and everything that's going on that that's, your, uh, that's everything you do, right? No, get out there, be aware, look for, watch for the things that are happening, but find that balance and make sure that what you're thinking about God outweighs those things that we're being challenged by. Now start changing our mind and our thinking. So in, instead of thinking of the worries and concerns of the world around us, think on these things, he says. Think of the spiritual things. Think of God. That's, and I, that's why number three, I've called it, we need to trust in God's message. Now God's given us so much in his word for us to read and study through. It's a work to read through the Bible in a year, isn't it? And I trust that. Hopefully you have a read-it-through program of, that you're following, and there's a number of them out there. And, you know, even as a pastor, it's still, there's days when it's like, oh, man, i got to read extra today because I missed yesterday, right? But I tell you, this word is filled with so many things that talk about God and his goodness, his power, his grace, his mercy, his love. You know, lots for us to think on, isn't it? And we could, be, you know, we could be consumed all day long by just considering the things of the Lord. Well, that'd be far better than spending our days consumed by the things we cannot change and the things we cannot alter. To have the joy of the Lord, we need to trust in God's Son, we need to be saved, we need to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We need to trust in God's power. Recognize who God is. Have a right view of God and know that God is still working in our lives. And we need to trust in God's message. Shift our thinking from the worry and concern of all that is going on around us to giving God his due and thinking about the things of God, the things of Jesus Christ, and thinking about what God can do, amen, and recognizing that he is still in control. Is your joy full today? I hope that it is. And I know we go through phases sometimes where it just doesn't feel as full as we'd like for it to be. But it can be, amen, if we keep our eyes on him. Father, we thank you for our time this morning and this opportunity for us to be together once again. Lord, I do pray that for each of us our joy will be full as we trust and obey you and live for you each and every day of our lives knowing that no matter what challenges we may face, you are still in control. You're still there for us, and your presence is with us each and every day. So, Lord, help us to maintain our joy as being full and trusting in you. Now, Lord, I pray as we go from here, you'll be with us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Let us take our hymn books once again. 386. All for Jesus, we are going to stand and we will sing verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 1 and verse 2 as we close. Let's stand and we'll sing. All for Jesus. 